Well, Gerald, this next case, I'm, I can't wait to hear your insight on it because it's like it's been happening in your backyard. So we go to Georgia where 23-year-old Brian Anthony Roden, an aspiring rapper, has been charged in connection with a July 3rd murder of three men at Pine Tree Country Club. I remember when this was breaking because it, it made huge headlines because it was you know, it's like, was there a, lo- was there a, a, a shooter at a golf course? What, were more people subject and threatened? I mean, there was so much going on at the time. Um, and the thing about this case, Gerald, that we're going to talk about is, and I'm going to say is really police incompetence. I, I know police don't, um, don't want to um, own up to this part. But we're going to get to that in a second because they apparently had the shooter in custody on an unrelated traffic charge for three days for three days in a neighboring county's jail and didn't even know it. And they set the alleged shooter murderer free. Now, I just like you you can't how they even got him back is even more incredible than the fact that they let him walk. So anyway, let's let's get into the details of the case. So Brian, who lives in Atlanta, is best known as B-Rod. He was charged with three counts of malice murder, five counts of felony murder, three counts of aggravated assault, two counts of kidnapping with bodily injury, possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony, and tampering with evidence according to the indictments. A lot of charges here. Brian is currently being held in the Cobb County Jail without bond. Now, he was arrested on July 8th. That is five days after the fatal shootings. He was actually arrested on the night of the shootings for a traffic charge. Apparently, he was stopped by police um, for having all sorts of problems with the fancy Maserati that he was driving. So he gets picked up, spends three days in jail. Meanwhile, the cops in the other county are looking for a murderer. Gerald, I can't even believe this. Well, I mean, this case is very disturbing. And I remember as it was happening, it was it was local news and then it was national news and then it was international news because they believed that they had a serial killer on the loose. You know, you had this affluent neighborhood in Cobb County where you had a, a, a golf pro who was murdered uh, on the golf course. And then in the car, you had two additional bodies. And so Atlanta was in a a flux because, you know, you had essentially a serial killer. And and so the police were putting out all this information that led people in the wrong direction. Um, I believe the initial report was they were looking for a either a brown complected or slightly darker complected Hispanic male when they first put it out. Uh, Marietta and Cobb County Police put it out. And and I was curious because I'm like, okay, so what makes you think It was that type of person or a person that looks like that. And and so as we moved on and found out more details and then they came up with the suspect, I was very concerned and I still am concerned. I want to know what evidence they have that ties this individual to these allegations. And the thing that the defendant has going for him is he has one of the most high profile defense attorneys in the state, Bruce Harvey, who is by all accounts, one of the best, if not the best defense attorney in the state of Georgia. So I'm thoroughly interested in hearing how this case plays out. I know Mr. Uh, you know Flynn Brody, who's a district attorney, is very competent. We've had a couple cases together. Uh, so it's interesting to see how this case is going to play out. Oh, it's got so many moving parts to it and, and so many missed cues like that and missed opportunities and police work that actually seems shoddy. So I, I really am very curious how this is going to work. I, I agree with you. I think it actually pokes a lot of holes that makes it possible for the suspect in this case to m- make a stronger argument than usual that maybe you got the wrong person here, or at least they can make a convincing argument. So let's look at some of these details because they're pretty extraordinary. So he is charged, Brian is charged with with binding and, and then gagging two of the victims. And then he drove them in the back of this pickup truck 
to the country club on July 3rd. So apparently, so, so the killers got two dead bodies in the back of the car and then drives onto the golf course, which in of itself, I don't play golf, but I know that that's like, that's a bizarre incident by itself. And then what ends up happening is that the Pine Tree Golf Pro, Gene Siller, 46 years old, he ends up getting shot and killed as well. The belief by authorities is that he was not an intended target, but simply he probably was like, what the heck is this truck doing on, I forget what, the 10th hole, and was shot by uh, the killer who had two bodies in the back. So investigators say that the white pickup truck drove onto that 10th hole around 2 p.m. So that would, must have been a pretty busy time. They say that Brian was driving the truck with the two dead bodies. Gene was shot in the head, this is the golf pro, on the 10th green. The men were identified as Paul Pearson, 76 years old, of Topeka, Kansas, and Henry Valdez, 46 years old, of Anaheim, California. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution reports that Henry Valdez, one of the victims, was killed by a single gunshot to the head while Paul Pearson was shot several times in the back, arms, legs, and buttocks. So Paul is listed as being the owner of the pickup truck. Okay, so one of the victims, it's his pickup truck. So all three bodies, like we said, were found on the 10th hole of the golf club. Um, And it was a member of the country club, you know, told the local uh, news station, he he, he was like driving on the range and, and heard that there was a truck. So like everyone's like racing to figure out what's going on. And I don't think anyone at that moment thought that there was anything like serious that would lead to deadly. You could just have like maybe a drunk person who's driving on the 10th hole that shouldn't be doing that. All right. So now again, remember Brian is the one who's charged with this. The police allege that he left the crime scene, hid the handgun. um, And apparently there's an unidentified individual that was used to retrieve where the gun was hidden. Do you find that weird? Is there someone unidentified here in this case, Gerald? I find this all strange. And I think that the biggest thing that we need to remember is that these people um, were killed at some different time. And then the, the last victim, the golf pro, was killed on that day. It's Georgia. It's July. It's hot. You, if you have two bodies in the back of a truck, you're going to know that there are two bodies in the back of the truck. And now you have him driving onto the 10th green. You in a very affluent neighborhood in the middle of the day, uh, right before July 4th. So a lot of people are off. You know everybody's seeing all this stuff. And, and then you have, unfortunately, the golf pro who gets shot on the 10th green while other people are running to come see what happened. And all of a sudden, the alleged killer is able to get away and hide the, the, the weapon while you're all looking for a Hispanic male and not an African-American male. So it's just so many inconsistencies and problems in this case. And, and I'm, I'm still curious, you know, and I know you're going to get into it in a moment, but how do we connect Brian, the aspiring rapper, to all of this? And one thing I have not seen or read in any of the accounts so far, and there have to be, are where's all the surveillance video? You're going to tell me that there are no cameras on this fancy um, country club golf course? None? And that nobody else, right? Or ring cameras. You know, one thing I've learned in the last three or four years of practice, there's always a ring doorbell or some type of surveillance of a camera that's off in a tree or something. When you come into these neighborhoods, they have them in the trees where you can see. And so it just kind of pieces together the entire case. You know, my hope is that in this case, they have all of that because this is a very affluent neighborhood uh, at a country club. I'm sure there has to be surveillance. So again, that's some of the things that you would expect in discovery that they would turn over uh, that connects, you know, Brian to, to this case. 
And the other thing is the motive and whether they all knew each other. So police have not disclosed a motive for the killing or really any information about a possible connection. However, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution spoke with a friend of one of the victims of, of Henry, the one of the men who was killed, and apparently um, they knew each other through the cannabis trade. This is according to the newspaper. And they claim that Henry Valdez ran a marijuana dispensary in Orange County, California, called Hope for Humanity, and that Valdez and the other victim, Paul, you know, whose vehicle it was, the truck, that they'd been friends for a very long time. But again, other than that, and that is a separate report, that is not a police report, I'm still trying to figure out what is the connection? Like, what happened? What went wrong? We don't know that yet. And um, I suppose at some point, prosecutors are going to have to tell us as they move forward on this. So can we get back to the one part of this case that just drives me bonkers because I, I, I can't believe that this actually happened. So I want to talk about how um, on July Third, the day of the shooting, Brian was arrested approximately nine hours after the bodies were found on the golf course. Okay. Now remember, he's arrested, but police are still looking for the shooter. He's arrested not as the shooter, but he is arrested on these traffic violations. He is arrested by Shambly police for driving a black Maserati with temporary tags. Authorities say. Again, they didn't realize that he was a murder suspect. He was then, um, and, and the charges were several things, all misdemeanors, uh, including a DUI, a headlight violation, using a fake ID, driving without insurance, driving an unregistered vehicle, and using a license plate to conceal the identity of the vehicle. Okay, all uh, uh, that's why they took him in. And he ends up spending three days in the jail. This man is in custody for three days while police in the other jurisdiction are looking for the killer. Gerald, you know where I'm going with this. It's like... Where, where was the ball dropped? I mean, clearly he was either in the Shamley Police Department or he was in the DeKalb County Jail. And for, for your listeners who, or who don't know the um, geography of, of Atlanta, you know, Atlanta sits in between two counties, Fulton and DeKalb, and Cobb County is right across the border of the Chattahoochee River from Fulton County. So he was really less than 15 miles away, maybe 20 miles away from where these brutal and horrific killings happen. And he's in the jail. So that means he's been fingerprinted. And if there is forensic evidence, you can tie it. The crazy part about all this is the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, which usually has the crime lab, which does the forensics, is in DeKalb County, not more than seven miles from the detention center. So we can triangulate all of this and really get the evidence, you know, there to hold him in custody if he's actually the shooter. So again, these are all issues that I'm sure uh, that capable counsel Bruce Harvey will bring up in this investigation. And I'm hopeful that, you know, Cobb County has dotted their I's and, and, and crossed their T's because if they haven't, it's going to be interesting and fireworks in that courtroom. Oh, absolutely. So here's the next part of this that is equally crazy. So he gets released after three days and then they realize Someone realizes, I don't even know who the they is in this case. Someone realizes, ooh, you know what? We really need him back. We want to arrest him. And this is the part I find fascinating. So rather than just going to arrest him on the murder charges, right? The, um, the, the people who run the jail call him and say, oh, you know, when you were arrested, we seized a lot of money. Why don't you come down and get your money back? So he actually goes back to the jail that he had been released from to collect this money. And that's when he gets arrested on the triple murder. Now, Gerald, help me out here. Unless Brian himself is um, also not firing on all cylinders like clearly the police are in this case. I mean, if you were wanted for murder, would you ever show up 
to collect your money unless, of course, it was so much money that you needed it? Not on a misdemeanor, I wouldn't. And again, these are factors that are going to weigh in his favor at any bond hearing. You're out on a misdemeanor arrest, coming back to get your property from the misdemeanor arrest. You actually have probably heard about this triple homicide because it's very difficult in Atlanta with international attention on this case. It was on the news every single night for you to come back to the police station to come get your money and not expect that you were going to be arrested for a triple homicide that you know you committed. These are all factors that Mr. Harvey is going to use not only to probably fight the case, but to potentially get his client a bond. So they're going to have to lay out the facts of this case. And the thing about Georgia is you have a right to a preliminary hearing. So once he was arrested, they're going to have to have a committal hearing. It's, it's a call a committal hearing, meaning you commit the case over uh, from magistrate court to superior court. We have to lay out the facts and he's going to have his lawyer there. They're going to get to cross examine and go through all of the evidence. And we're going to know what evidence uh, the state has. So there's not going to be any secret. And, and I'm very concerned, especially starting from the first starting point where you're looking for somebody else to now this important factor that he's not trying to run. He's actually coming back to law enforcement. So we got some questions. Oh, some some very serious questions. And I have to say, I, it was one of the sheriffs, I was looking at one of the news conferences, and one of the sheriffs was, you know, telling the the reporters, it's like, you know, my folks haven't slept, they're exhausted, we're looking for the shooter. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, dude, your alleged shooter that you're looking for, who you say did it, is actually sitting behind bars. So I'm just like, maybe you need to let your officers sleep because clearly they're exhausted and they're missing massive clues, which you all say he did. Now, I have no idea. I have no idea, but I do agree with you, Gerald. There are some major problems with this and, and law enforcement clearly, if he is if he is the shooter, then they drop the ball a lot of times. If he is not the shooter, then they still drop the ball a lot of times. I, I've, I haven't seen anything quite like this, honestly. I don't no, recall I seen, anything like this. I haven't seen anything like this in a long time. And again, you know, having practiced law in Georgia for 16 years and been around Mr. Harvey, had cases with Mr. Harvey, um, he is a very conscientious lawyer. And for him to take this case raises even more uh, caution uh, flags in my head that there's something wrong with this case. And I'm interested in seeing um, the, the committal hearing probably after I get off this podcast, I'm probably going to call Bruce and say, I know you can't tell me a whole lot, but what do I need to think about when I, when I think about this case, should I go get the warrants and just read the warrants and figure out what Cobb County has? And I'm sure he'll point me in the right direction, but I, I think that there's going to be some serious problems in this case. Um, you know, my heart goes out to the victims in this case, uh, but there needs to be a motive and some type of tie in of why you have this individual in custody. And they need to make that available very soon because this case was international. They were giving press conferences. Uh, they were saying all manners of things in the media about, you know, what they believe happened here. And now you have a citizen whose uh, rights have been deprived. And most of the public does does not know why. So it's time for us to be a little bit more transparent on why he's in custody. And if he's a shooter, um, then present it to a grand jury, get an indictment, put it in front of 12 citizens for a trial, and we'll listen to the evidence and, and see uh, what you can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Gerald, what what um, do you think about the fact that he, Brian, does have uh, a criminal background and history in Georgia with law enforcement? I believe in 2016, when he was about 18 years old, he was charged with shooting a student at Georgia State University, where he was also attending in that case, according to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Although the shooting was described as drug-related, neither student was charged at all. Um, then in January of 2020, Brian was detained by a canine unit at the Atlanta airport. Uh, they said he had $19,000 in cash, which I don't believe is a crime, um, and that they sniffed marijuana in uh, one of his bags. Authorities acting on a tip got him to agree to give up the cash, uh, but he was arrested for assaulting two officers in the process. So there is a, some history here. He's got you know, some level of um, a criminal background. And the attorney who you keep referring to, Bruce Harvey, apparently 
um, has been his attorney on these other cases as well. So what are we to read into this, if anything? We're to read into this that those were allegations. Let's start with uh, what happened at Georgia State. He wasn't charged. It was not presented to the grand jury by the Fulton County District Attorney, which means that there was not probable cause to continue on in the prosecution of that case. So that case won't come in. The situation at the airport, I, I don't believe I heard a conviction in that one either. And I've had cases where individuals have had large sums of money at the airport had the money seized and not charged, and we had to file uh, 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 legal paperwork in Clayton County to get the money back. So, you know, allegations of probably a misdemeanor amount of marijuana and a large amount of cash with no criminal conviction means that, you know, Brian has no record except for the misdemeanor charges uh, that are in Chamley, which is probably why he has Bruce Harvey. Bruce is a very good lawyer. Uh, he's able to fight these cases both in a courtroom and outside of a courtroom. And those particular incidents will not come in. They are not admissible in a Georgia courtroom if they are not convictions. And so, Gerald, we have an update. I, I just found it in the notes because you asked, like, what happened with the airport case? So Brian bonded out on that case and the case is still pending, according okay. to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. OK, and that was a 2020 case. Yes, sir. January okay. 2020. So it got caught up in the pandemic. So it's probably going to be two years before that one comes up. Again, it's still an allegation. It's not going to come up uh, in the trial of this case uh, because it's not a conviction. It's not admissible. Um, but, you know, each case has to stand on its own. And he has to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt for the triple homicides. Now, those are very serious charges. It's very disturbing that anybody would be arrested on that. Uh, but again, in our country, um, Justice Thurgood Marshall said the most protected value that we have and that we espouse is the presumption of innocence. And it's uh, according to the state, it's up to the state to prove every essential element of a crime. In this case, they got to prove that Brian killed each and every person that they've alleged. And they have to have substantial uh, evidence that proves beyond a reasonable doubt that he did it. I'm interested to see what the state has. I think we all are. We all are. Thank you for your insight into that case. Anytime. Thank you.